You are listening to a live message from Gold Street Garden Church with Dr. Dominic Butler. We are thrilled to have you join us for today's message. Our prayer is that you would see Jesus clearer than ever before and your desire to know him personally would increase in Jesus' name. Amen. For more information about the church, you can go to goldstreetgarden.com. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you for just a day that the world can can create it to be this hyped up thing. And we just thank you. It is important to take time to celebrate and honor. So Father, we just thank you. We thank you for the wonderful Heavenly Father that you are, that you are the ultimate example of love and kindness and generosity and grace and forgiveness and wisdom and correction. Father, we thank you. We honor you, Father. But we thank you for all the dads in here, and we thank you for the sacrifices that they have made, Father. And we thank you that as they seek you, Father, that they would not be concerned. They would not look to the left, to the right. They would not look back, but they would look forward, Father. We thank you that daily they would seek you. And Father, we thank you that when we seek you, we find you. When we knock, the doors are open, Father. We thank you for the wisdom. We thank you that in no you, there's empowerment, there's joy, there's strength, Father. So we just glorify you, Lord. We thank you for the fathers. We thank you for the strengthening. We thank you that another voice that they would not follow. We thank you that they enter into your secret place and they continue to walk in it throughout the day, Father. We thank you that it's an overflow, that their love for their wives and their children, it's an overflow of their love for you. We thank you, Father. We thank you that they would love their wives and children as Christ loved the church. Father, we thank you that it's not just a saying. We thank you that it gets so deep within their hearts and their spirits, Father, that it's just, it just is such a most beautiful thing that there's always joy within the house, Father. We thank you. We thank you for knowing when it's time to do certain things and when it's not. And when we can push things to the side and we can just say, we're going to just stop and we're going to celebrate. We're going to dance. Let's just honor the Lord. Father, I thank you for just those joy moments within the homes. Father, we thank you that, that sometimes there can be so much just stress and just waking up and checking things off. But we thank you, Father. We thank you that we're not idly walking and just walking around, Father, but we're walking in the joy and in the peace and in the comfort. Father, we thank you that we operate in the fruits of the Spirit, Lord. And we thank you for the wives. We thank you for just strengthening them. We thank you for praying together as husband and wife. Father, we thank you for speaking your word and it, and it being decreed and we see it. We see it growing and prospering, Father. We just glorify you. We thank you for strength and healing and wholeness within their houses, Father. We thank you for their family members, Lord. We just worship you and we honor you. We honor the dads and we just thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We just thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for guidance and directions for each step, Father, and that if you just tell us to go to the left or the right, even though we think we're doing one thing, we thank you that it's going to bring promotion and it's going to bring peace, Father. We thank you for your peace. Even in transition and changes, Father, we thank you that we look unto you, Father, each and every day that you are the author and the finisher of our faith and you are faithful to complete what you have started, Father. So we thank you. We thank you. We thank you that each father is going to finish the race, Father, and that they're going to bring souls and they're going to bring other people into your kingdom, Lord. We thank you for a stirring up and a fire to burn within them to just tell people about your goodness and your faithfulness, Lord. So we thank you and we praise you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. (laughs) Praise God. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you what, (laughs) it's so important and you're going to find the dads on those, but I just want to make sure all the, everybody knows that there's such an attack on, on fathers and in this nation, such an attack on fathers. And the, the devil knows that if he can destroy the image of what a father is, 
he destroys a family. And if he can destroy what a family is, then the world is in chaos because family is what God orchestrated to be the foundation of mankind, to be the foundation of humanity. That so many times people are are saying, we need to get prayer back in schools. Well, maybe you need to get prayer back in your own home. Maybe you need to be fighting to get prayer back in your church services, that it's not just a uh, some religious monologue, but that it's a spirit-filled prayer that you can tell that when the minister prays that the presence of God is actually there. I'm, I'm telling you, I think we would all agree. Do you know the reason why it's so easy to shut the church doors is because they weren't doing anything that really caused people to want to be there in the first place. They could, if you could, you know, it's important that we understand the value of the presence of God and gathering and seeing what's, what's really available, what's really there. And tonight the Lord has placed a word on my heart that I really believe that there, there's, there's times that we don't see Sometimes words get kind of thrown. There's Christianese terms we'll hear at times. And one of those words I want to address tonight, and I want to talk about the anointing tonight. I want to go into a great deal. And some of us know the anointing very well, but some of us hear the word anointing and we don't really understand. We don't really know. And I want to go through this because the devil would love for you not to know what the anointing is. Let's put it that way. The devil would love for you not to know what the anointing is. And tonight the message is called close contact. Because the thing about the anointing is when we talk about the anointing, it's about something being smeared. It's about being smeared, like completely covered. So in the Old Testament, they would pour anointing oil on a priest, a king, or a prophet. And the reason they would do it on those three is because those three would bring the dominion of the kingdom of God to a nation, to an empire, but it would all be because the anointing on their life, it would bring forth a word. And then some of the prophets like Elijah and Elisha operated in extreme miracles. Did you know that that same anointing is on your life that you can operate? And you see, and that's the thing you got to get this tonight because the devil would love for you to just live a normal American life. But here's the thing is that America is not your home. Heaven is your home, and you just happen to be here right now. I love our nation. I love America. And I, that's why I want to teach on the anointing tonight, because the church needs to wake up. Church needs to really get understand what's going on. But when I talk about close contact in the Old Testament, the reference was you pour this anointing oil on a priest, a king, or a prophet, and then the Spirit of God would come upon them. But in the New Testament, when Jesus, when he died on the cross, you know, right you. If you were about to die and you had to to speak to your family about if you knew you had a few moments with your family, wouldn't you tell them very important things? Do you know what Jesus decided to talk to the disciples about his last moments? The Holy Spirit. Do you know how many churches don't believe in the Holy Spirit or they'll even just they'll even just think it's a power for the Holy Spirit is a person. And he is actually in he. The Holy Spirit, Jesus died on the cross so that we could be forgiven of sins, but so that the Holy Spirit would come and dwell in our hearts and that the anointing oil in the Old Testament would come upon as a, as a reference. But in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is the anoint, is the anointing that what is in the Old Testament, but he is the embodiment of the anointing and that he reveals the anointed one. Because did you know Jesus Christ? Jesus means Savior, but Christ means anointed one. So for you not to know what the anointing is means you don't know who Jesus is. He's the anointed one, but he's, the, he's anointed to save. I really believe that sometimes the, the devil doesn't even mind the name Jesus. But when you start making saying Jesus Christ... Christ, the anointed one, that something happens that when you know who he is, you've had close contact with him. Has anybody seen God deliver them from something? Has somebody been delivered from a past life? I used to be addicted to cocaine. I used to have different things. I had a close contact experience with God, the anointing came in my life. And you know, the first scripture I want you to turn to is Isaiah 10, 27. Some of you will know this scripture as soon as I start reading it, but the Bible, it's very important we get our eyes on scripture. Do you, do you realize how important it is you read your word? You read the word of God. 
It is so important that you are in these scriptures and seeing what it's, it's literally some people watch the news. If you read the Bible, you'll be always 10 steps ahead of what's going on in the world. You'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, this, this kind of stuff. I've read about that in First Timothy. Oh, no, I read about that in Isaiah. I read, because the Bible is way ahead of anything. The, the devil is putting these blockades up right now, but we need to be fully aware. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.27, it says to give no foothold, no room to the enemy. Did you know every day all he wants to do is get you to compromise just a little? Because if he gets you to compromise a little today, you'll compromise more tomorrow. I'll say that again. The devil knows. He, the devil is not going to just try to get you off the rails in one big thing. He'll just try to get you to compromise just a little bit here. And then, and the Lord spoke this to me literally during worship. He said, temptation resisted is love understood. Temptation resisted is love understood. Because when you resist temptation, it's not because of your own willpower. It's not because, oh, I'm not going to do it. It's because his love has encountered you in such a way that soon as a temptation comes, you see it as a counterfeit to what he's already given you. Amen. That when the devil tries to tempt you with, with, some, with lust of life, with lust of different things, he'll try to tempt you with these things and you're able to smell it from a mile away and be like, God's already gave that to me. What you're trying to get me through a counterfeit, he's already given it to me. You're trying to give me pleasures from this world, but I got pleasures forevermore. You're trying to give me an experience, a high but I'm in love with the Most High. And that's not just a funny statement. I'm telling you that during times of worship, I get, I feel like I'm just like, what is going, like, I can't drive right now. His love is overflowing. It's real. And the devil knows that's why drugs are made. That's why all, all this stuff, it's a perverted form of what the presence of God has to offer you. You want to you have an experience? Put your eyes on Jesus for a little bit and get him off the world. Get them off the things because there are so many people right now that they're addicted to hearing bad news. They're addicted to hearing these things. But you start getting some good news, hearing about what God has for you. You realize you could actually, everywhere your foot treads, could actually be yours. You know, I was listening to R.W. Schambach recently. I've been, I, I tell you what, I got to stop listening to R.W. Schambach when I'm mowing the lawn and doing things because I just start running around my yard. I start like doing, I just get all fired up listening to some Holy Ghost preaching. And you know, he, he said he, there was a building that he wanted to get. It was this building that he wanted and he was preaching there every every night, but he was renting the facility. And I was like, as soon as I heard him say this, I was like, I need to hear this. I need to hear this because I need my own facility. And he was renting this facility. He's preaching. He goes up to the facility one night and there's a real estate sign in the lot. And you know what he does? He gets out of the car, pulls the real estate sign out of the ground, goes to the real estate office, and he throws it on the desk. And he says, why are you trying to sell my building? And they're like, Reverend, that's not your building. You're renting it. He says, it's mine. I already walked around it. And, you know, a lot of us think that's crazy. But the thing is, is that in the, he's operating in what the Lord has told him. He walked around a facility just like they walked around the walls of Jericho. He walked around it declaring it. And then, you know, what he said, well, what are you going to offer us for the building? You know what he says? Nothing. He's like, you really are a man of faith. And he's like, you know what? God started with nothing when he created the earth. And I'm going to start with nothing when I'm negotiating. Let God do something. And I was like, come on, come on. I'm, not, I'm like turning my lawnmower off now. And I'm like, oh, you know, just hearing it. You're getting excited. And then all this. And then he's like, he's like, well, we just turned down an offer of 260,000. We're not going to take, take nothing. And he's like, I'll give you 70,000 for it. He's like, it just came out of my spirit. He's like, we just turned down 260. He said, is this your building boy? Or are you just a real estate boy? And he's like, well, it is in my building. And R.W. Schambach was older than this guy, so I guess he could talk to him that way. But he wasn't being, he was just like going on the anointing. But he just said, he said this to him and he's like, no. He's like, call, call the man that owns the building. He calls the man that owns the building. He says, I'm just calling you because the reverend's like pesting me right now. I know you just turned down 260. He's offering you 70,000. And he's like, okay, okay. And he hangs the phone up. He's like, 
they're going to give this building to you for 70000 because they're going to use all the rest of the money as tax write-off for this business owner so that you can have it. So he got this building because he marched in there, because he believed the word of God. So many times we go by based off what we think, what we hear, the facts that we've heard, different things. But I need to tell you guys, we need to start walking around some facilities. We need to start proclaiming what God has for us in this hour. Isaiah 10, 27, it shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. The Bible says that every yoke will be destroyed by the anointing. Now, here's the thing. Once again, Christianese terms, it's important we understand what a yoke is. A yoke is something that they put around an oxen's uh, neck and shoulders, and it, he would carry a load, uh, you know, of of whatever it was, harvest supplies or whatever it would be, and he would carry it. Does anybody remember in Matthew eleven? We read it a couple weeks ago. What did Jesus say? Come to me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But the devil is trying to get you to carry a yoke that you were never designed to carry. And that's why people are stressed. That's why people are committing suicide because they're carrying a yoke that they were never meant to carry. They're carrying their addictions. They're carrying these things and that's not who they were created to be. They, the reason they're dealing with addictions is because they're actually supposed to be addicted to God. The reason they're dealing with finding pleasures and all these different things is because they just haven't understood that it's right there. It's right there. But the thing that's so fascinating, and I want to read this in the New Living Translation. It says, in that day, the Lord will end the bondage of his people. Come on, say, he will end the bondage of his people. So many times I hear people getting so, and you know, it, it, we have to understand that it was done at the cross. Did you know we make things so complicated sometimes that if you just saw him in the way that I'm, because that's the thing is that I, I can only preach what the Lord has revealed in my heart, what I'm seeing in the thing. And I, what I, what the Lord has delivered me of, I preach it and I believe that it can transfer because the anointing, it's the same anointing, right? I didn't receive a little Holy Ghost. I received the same Holy Ghost that you have the ability to receive. It's nothing special about me. I'm just operating in a gift that the Lord has had in this moment, but the Lord has gifts and operations that we all mo are mobilized in, but it's through this anointing. But he breaks the yoke of bondage and it says of his people, he will break the yoke of slavery. Did you know the devil, what did Jesus say? He says that if you sin, you're a slave of sin. Sometimes people think that they can actually control how much they sin. There's believers that think this way, like I'm only going to do a little bit more. If you do it at all, you're a slave. That's not my words, that's Jesus' words. But he says that those who abide in my word are my disciples indeed, and they shall know the truth, and the truth shall make them free. What was the Holy Spirit's main job? To lead us into all truth. And what does the truth do? It makes you free. I, I need a witness tonight. Does anybody know what it means? Like I brought this up last week that, that sometimes, and this has happened to me a lot lately, like today I'm thinking about just, I get in the secret place with the Lord and I'm like, Lord, how did I operate yesterday knowing you this much today? Like, cause I go from glory to glory and I realize that yesterday it's revealed, you know, Wow, you today, like it's not the same. It's better every day when you're going after him. And that's the thing. I want to be around people that love Jesus so much. That's why Jackie and I, we really believe that this was supposed to be mobilized this year. And look at everything that's happened in 2020. We've joked about it. I've had, I cannot tell you how many people that came up to me seriously saying, wow, you really picked a wrong time to launch. I was like, I didn't pick it. So you better watch out what's going to happen because because we we launched at the start of 2020. And you know, the reason that was is because the Lord is raising up a people that are obsessed with his presence, a people, a people that aren't ashamed to operate in the gifts of the spirit, walk in the power of his spirit. We will not make a pot. We're not here to have a nice little, uh, you know, the Lord wants to do something so great right now. He will break the yoke of slavery and he will lift it from their shoulders. A New Living Translation. If you go back just one chapter, it says in Isaiah 9, 6, it says this. For unto us a child is born, speaking of Jesus, 
Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. This is powerful because we just read that he wants to lift it from our shoulders. And what is the, the thing about a yoke that's really interesting when you look it up in the Hebrew is it's always talking about political dominion, political dominion. Does anybody think that the, the devil is involved with politics? Raise your hand. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm saying? It's, here's the way you have to look at it from just a natural perspective. You don't even have to get all spiritual about it. Just think about it, just doing the math. If the devil can't get a believer that's sold out for Christ to bow, what he'll do is he'll go to whoever is operating that land, that government, and force his dominion, his kingdom of darkness on the, the leaders in charge and get them to force believers to bow. But guess what? We're not going to bow. Amen. Can we, we, we have to understand that there is, there's going to be times and you know, that's why we have to preach the gospel in such a way right now, because there's going to be times you're going to have to draw a line in the sand. You know, this, this past year, you know, we had some of you, if you didn't know, we had cops come to one of our services that we, we had. Cops came from every entrance of a parking lot we were at. One night we were having service when it was, you know, really. And, you, you know, something went off in me that night. And I was just like, all right. <laughs> like, you know, if this is what it is, you know, this is what it is. Because I, the, I told you all at the beginning, we're, we're, we're not making a political stance in what we do. We have to do it because if you're doing it to prove a point, you'll fall on your face. If you're doing it for him, he'll lift you up. Amen. And that's the thing that's so beautiful is I have to be true to what's in here because, and I love what you said recently, Pastor Mark, when we were at Cracker Barrel. So good. You said, because Cracker Barrel is amazing. But it, he said, it was a quote that you heard. And it says, if you, if you need the people, you can't lead the people. What a, and what, a, what a, a wise quote that is. And that's what we see in the world is that so many times when people are building Christian social clubs or things like that, they're, they're, they're accommodating the people. And the greatest hindrance to the anointing is man's opinion. The greatest hindrance to the anointing is what man thinks. Because what man thinks is always opposite of what God is trying to do. That's why we have to die daily die to our flesh. But this thing about the yoke is that the devil is trying to get all of us to carry something. Has anybody even being a born again believer going out, have there been times where you just felt like you're carrying something that you shouldn't be? Like, it's just like all of a sudden you, you almost, sometimes you get a little sick even thinking about something or you just, why am I feeling this way? Why am I this distressed? Why is this happening? And it's because the devil is trying to get you to take a yoke of him and he's trying to get you to carry something you were never meant to carry because Jesus carried that yoke to Calvary and that he carried it and he died and bled on a cross so that you could walk in freedom. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Acts 10:38. Acts 10:38. Jesus. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with what? The Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good, healing, how many? All who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. I want to read this again. We need to hear things. How God anointed, so anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. So it wasn't just oil. Remember when Jesus gets baptized? The Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove in bodily form. Isn't it so powerful? It uses that term bodily. It means that he was completely embodied by the Holy Spirit. Now, can I ask you all something? Does Jesus, does Jesus ever get, do you ever hear about Jesus as a boy with the devil tempting him and the devil going at him? But soon as he gets anointed with the Holy Spirit, isn't it amazing how the devil knows all right, I'm coming after this guy now because the anointing puts the devil on notice. But here's the thing. I want you all to understand. I, I'm not here tonight to talk about new levels, new devils. I hate that statement, just for the record. It's new levels, same devil. 
new level, same devil, same defeated foe that has no power and authority. Jesus said, all authority has been given unto me and I give it unto you. Therefore, go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of me. Jesus, not me, just for the record, not Don. I'm not preaching blasphemy. <laughs> Hallelujah. All authority has been given to him and he gave it to you. But you need, the, you need to understand the anointing because Jesus, when he got anointed, what did the anointing do? When he got baptized, what got sealed? His identity as a beloved son and his father being proud of him. So what does the anointing to do? The anointing doesn't just make you this power hungry person. No, the anointing seals who you are in Christ and seals your relationship with your father. And then you walk in a family dominion in the kingdom of God. And because, and because you love him so much, what happens is you begin to hate the things that he hates. And right now there's a lot of wickedness going on to the left and the right. And that's why I'm preaching this message tonight, because we need to wake up and we need to allow the anointing to start flowing through us in such a way that we say, Lord, what's breaking your heart right now? And use me as a vessel to let your anointing flow through my life. Amen. 1 John 2, hallelujah. I, 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 did you know you, you can feel the anointing? You know I can feel the anointing? Because the anointing is the Holy Spirit. He's a person. Hallelujah. 1 John 2, verse 18. Little children, it is the last hour. <laughs> Just <laughs> He wrote this 2,000 years ago. We must be in the last millisecond. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. Do you know what the Antichrist is? Any spirit that opposes Christ. You know it's not anti-Jesus, it's anti-anointing. Not anti-somebody throw me a, a life jacket, it's anti-the anointing. That's why the devil doesn't care about so many churches because they don't operate in any type of anointing. They have no relationship to allow the Holy Spirit to move. 50 minutes, let's get out of here. Everybody needs to go watch the game. Everybody's got this. We have to understand that. I understand that when there's a lot of people, I understand different things with time. But yeah, if you ask Pastor Rodney at the river, he does it. It's like that. And that's where I came from. So that's how, I, you know, it's like, you know, but it's like where people, where people operate, that it's like the Holy Ghost gets this amount of time, this amount of time. Now, don't get me wrong, the Holy Ghost can do so much in one second, but he's worthy of more than one second. Amen. But he's, he's merciful enough to do it. But the devil is anti-anointing. That's why he's anti-Christ. It's a spirit of anti-anointing because Christ is the anointed one. That's why you've, we've, and let's just, let's talk real. You've been in services before. You've been in church services before where you sat through it and it was painful. The reason it was painful is because the Holy Spirit was grieved because he couldn't speak. He couldn't talk. He couldn't. A muzzle was put over him. But we have to be the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has put a message in your heart. He has put, and you know what that message is? It is Jesus through you because Christ in you is what? The hope of glory. What is glory? The manifestation of the presence of God. When you start talking about what Jesus has done for you, the glory begins to manifest. I can't tell you how many times I'm on the street. Yesterday, I got to meet this awesome guy named Mel when I'm out on the streets of minister. Yeah, you remember Mel? I'm walking. Mel, he's like, hey, man. And I'm like, all right, we're talking about Jesus. <laughs> you know, it's like, you say hi to me. We're talking about Jesus. And he, he walked up and he started saying, he's like, he's like, how are you doing tonight, man? And I was like, I'm doing great. He was sitting by himself outside of Panera Bread. And I'm like, can I sit with you, man? And he's like, yeah. And we sat and we started talking about Jesus, started talking about the Lord. And all of a sudden, he was talking about how he was a little depressed 
about some things going on. And you could just see he began to smile. He began, and even other brothers came up and he just started talking with everybody. And it was just like, he was a believer, but he was really in a discouraged time. But you see, the thing is, is that that's what happens when you love the Lord, you wake up the sleepers. You wake up the sleepers because love is the alarm clock for the kingdom of God. It's like all of a sudden you start loving on people, not because you're trying to get a reaction, but because you actually do. I'm not loving them with my own ability. I'm loving them because he has loved me so much that when I see a brother, when I see a sister, I, I can't get allow my mind to be like, oh, well, they did this or this is how they're talking. This is a child that the father wants to bring home and that he has equipped me to be able to speak. He's given words of anointing that will drop like a nuclear Holy Ghost bomb. So which we have known that this is the, the last hour in verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they may be manifest that none of them were of us. But you, everybody say, but you, but you. Have, an anointing. have an anointing. Say that again. I have an anointing, have an anointing. From, the Holy One. from the Holy One. And say this, you know all things. Come on. Sometimes you need to read this and be like, is this for real? Is, is, this, is this something going on? Because there's so many people that they feel like they can't step out on what God has said because you know what the devil is so good at? Intimidation. And that's where I want to kind of invest the rest of the night because this is not a Sunday morning Bible class that the way that people think David and Goliath is one of the most powerful stories in the Bible. And I, I really believe that sometimes people have limited it to just being a children's story. But guess what? Those children are going to be, that's where the service is at. That's where the, because we need to be like children, right? Have childlike faith that they want to, David and Goliath is probably the, the greatest message the church needs to hear right now after the cross to really see, because the, the, the enemy is all about intimidation. If he can get you to forfeit your call, if he can get you to think that what's in you isn't that great, that you don't really need to step out on it, that there's really not enough there, he'll just keep you handicapped, stuck in a rut. But he has no power. We talked about it before, that the only power the enemy has is what you give him with your will saying that you, you give in to the thoughts like, yeah, I really am not where I need to be. You know, I really should have done that years ago. That's why I can't do this. That's why I can't. And you, you don't realize that what we serve a God of immediately, the God of now, that you don't understand the power of repentance, that when you repent, that when you come before the Lord and said, Lord, I missed it, but Lord, I want to be used of you in this hour, whatever it is, even if you just want me to go serve at a local body just to hear where I need to be or whatever it would need to be. Like so many times people think that the only way they're really being used of God is if they're doing some, and you know, my wife that is that like I was sharing about before, how she helps at home and does things. I know that the Lord's got a word on her heart. She's going to be preaching here real soon. Everybody know that. She's going to be preaching. But we don't realize that where people are, that the sacrifices that people make for the body of Christ, like right now in the children's church, there's people that are watching children so that other people are able to focus on the things. Do you think that's important? Yeah. And that they're pouring into children, loving on them back. Do you think that's important? Stuff like that, but so many times, if I'm not being seen, well, how did David get anointed? Was it by being seen? I don't want to serve and follow somebody that just wants to be seen. I want to follow somebody that hides behind the cross because the only reason I am who I am is because he is who he is. Amen. But read that again. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. And then if you skip down to verse 27, it says, But the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and is just as it has taught you, you will abide in Him, the Spirit of the Lord 
that comes and it teaches. Has anybody learned things that when you were just singing to the Lord in worship, that, that the Lord will just begin to download things in your heart, teach you great things? And what I, I cannot tell you how many times I was reading my Bible and just I'm reading it and it's like what I'm reading, the Holy Spirit is actually speaking to me something based around nothing that I'm even looking at. But he is such a great teacher. You want to talk about the greatest homeschool teacher ever? It is the Holy Ghost. People that are against homeschooling, well, you just ask the Holy Spirit about that because the Holy Spirit knows how to do some serious homeschooling. Hallelujah. Psalm 20, you don't have to turn there, but Psalm 23, 5, David says that you anoint, that you prepare a table in the presence of my enemies and you anoint my head with oil and it overflows. My cup overflows. So when did David get anointed in this story? It's in the presence of his enemies. Do you remember who were David's kind of enemies? It was his own family. His own family. Because when you read the story, when David, and act, let's just go there. Go to, go to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 16. The more convinced you become of who Jesus is, the more convinced you become the enemy is defeated. The more you become convinced of who Jesus is, the more you become convinced the enemy is defeated. That it's so easy for us to believe that the enemy is defeated and kind of say it. But the more you see Jesus, the more his defeat, the enemy's defeat is evident. Because this whole book is about how defeated he is. Whenever you read a truth about how good God is, it reveals how defeated he is. Do you see that? That every time a promise of God is revealed, a curse to him is for you. You know, the devil does not belong in your bank account. The devil does not belong in your mind. The devil does not belong in your family. The devil does not belong in your addictions. The devil does not belong in your affairs. The devil belongs one place and it's under your feet. He, you know why he belongs under your feet? Because he's defeated. It is so important that we know this and you have to understand the way that the devil, he's so subtle. He's so crafty. He just comes. He doesn't come to your front porch with horns on. He comes dressed as the plumber and he sees if he can come in and fix a leak for you. He comes in and he tries to say that, did God really say this? Are you really called to do this? Are you really this? Are you really that? And that's what's going on in our world right now is that there, there's conversations being started by mass media that is complete. And it's not even people. It's demonic. Anybody, can, you just need, that's why the Bible says our, our war is not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities and darkness. And if the church doesn't wake up to the fact that we've been called to this moment to speak things out, but not only to declare things, but to walk in the authority that God has given us and understand that the Holy Spirit has, is, a, the anointing is on the inside of us, that we can lay hands on the sick and they recover. Do you believe that? Yes. Do you believe that your hands because of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. It has nothing to do with how good or how many scriptures you know. It has to do with how much do you believe he is who he is. And if you believe it, he will do it through you. Amen. And the, the enemy wants the church to be broke. Right. Doing fundraisers all the time. Show me where Jesus and his disciples did a camel wash. <laughs> to raise money. Show, show me where they're selling bread. They gave it away. Even when they didn't have it, they multiplied. I'm at a place where I want, I, you know, we, we want finances to come in, we speak it, but I would just like to see the Lord just turn property. I would just like to see things happen in such a way where it's just, I want people to say, that had to be God. Come on. Not, not just we raised enough money. Come on. No, God is bigger than that. He's so much bigger than that, that we're not going to allow the devil to sock us with COVID-19, sock us with all this rioting, sock us with all these things, and then we just raise some money. We're going to raise a standard. Amen. The anointing, showing people. That's why I really believe with Gold Tree, Kingdom Life, the church, people that are going after the things of God, that it's like 
People are going to start coming because they know if they bring their family member in a wheelchair, they're not leaving in that wheelchair. Not because of the minister, not because it's because the presence of God is going to be so hosted in such a way that we we just exalt the anointed one, that we do what he says, and that people are attracted to the obedience, to the voice of God, and they surrender their lives. They surrender the things that they're going after because we, we don't realize that obedience to the Father is what allows the anointing to flow in the greatest way. And I said it a few weeks ago, but when God speaks something to your heart, don't give it enough time to go to your head. I love that. Because when you give it enough time to go to your head, you start, beep, boop, beep, boop, that won't work. You know, I can't do that. You know, that's not possible. God loves the impossible. It's his favorite. In fact, if you're facing an impossible situation right now, good. That's you're right where you need to be. You're right where you need to be, trusting in him to see a miracle happen, not just try to figure it out, not just try to go by this. You know, I, let me test this one on you. I love this one. That sounds really awesome that you're going to do it. Make sure you use wisdom, brother. Now, some people really do need to hear that. But, I'm not, <laughs> but the reason that I get a little sour with it, because I've seen, I've, I've said that to people sometimes when I knew I shouldn't have. So I'm even using that wisdom is Jesus. He is our wisdom. Does it sound like spitting on the ground and rubbing dirt in somebody's eyes is wisdom? Ask that to Jesus. Does it sound like it's wisdom to to take a roof off a place and drop somebody down? And then Jesus says, that's faith right there. The way that God operates is way beyond the way that we, we do. Amen. So when David gets anointed king, he was just a little boy. And let's read through this. You want to read a few scriptures? And then, now the Lord said to Samuel, I'm going to start at verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Why did he reject Saul? If you read the chapter before, Saul didn't listen to God because he listened to the people. That's why politics can't solve anything in America, because They listen to the people. The people are swayed by any report. It's it's so fickle. You you can make that the enemy, we talked about it for weeks, the, the world is the enemy's puppet. All he has to do is say one thing, release one one video, release one thing. He knows exactly how to set it up. But the church, we're not distracted by those things. We only see him, we're after him, what he has. So fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. But the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice. I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. Isn't it amazing how? the divine instruction was hidden in a sacrifice. That's sometimes exactly what you need to hear is hidden in a step of obedience, hidden in a step of things that sometimes you don't know what to do, but you're hearing the Lord tell you to do this one thing. And you're like, but that's not what I need right now. But the Lord is saying, if you do this one thing, you do it. And then all of a sudden the instruction comes. The, 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 you feel the weight of what the Lord is calling you to do, telling you to do. Now, verse 4, so Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Now, isn't it amazing? He consecrates all the sons, but we're going to find out David wasn't even consecrated properly. He wasn't even, he wasn't even a part of the, the process to make sure it's right. David's nowhere to be seen. He's not anywhere. But this is the people God is looking for. He's looking for people that aren't standing with their arms flexed saying, I'm the rock, you know, or saying, you know, pick me, I'm ready to be king. He's looking for those that have been obedient to just do what God has been telling them to do just being faithful to be serving in any way to see what needs to get done. You know what he was ultimately doing? He was honoring his father. 
because his father, his actual, his natural dad, he was honoring him because his father told him to go out and watch the sheep. Did you know if you study, it was actually, it was actually the, the girls in the family were supposed to watch sheep at that time. So David was the youngest boy given, you know, a task that, he, you know, it was something that could have been humiliating in some arenas to him, but he just did it unto the Lord. And you know what he did out there? He's jamming. He's jamming with the lambs. <laughs> Jam with the lamb, rock with the flock, sing to the king. You know what I'm talking about? Holla to the father. Amen. <laughs> it's like that's that was what he was out there and he was just worshiping God, doing these things. And all these other guys, they're lifting weights, training for the army. David's not training for the army. He's he's out there being Bo Pete. He's out there with the sheep. He's out there, but he's being faithful. He's being faithful and the anointing rests on people that are faithful, people that just keep moving forward, that aren't swayed by the world. They're not swayed by what's going on. David doesn't even know there's all these wars and stuff going on. He's just out there being responsible for what God and his father has told him to do. He's going after it. And then the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the what? Heart. He looks at the heart. That's why the most important thing you can do is make sure, you know what your greatest responsibility as a believer is to maintain a heart that's always ready to say yes to God. That's your responsibility as a believer is to maintain a heart that's always ready to say yes to God. That's your biggest responsibility. You know how you do that? You keep reading his word. You keep getting in his presence. You keep operating on the prompt things he puts on your heart. He'll speak little things to your heart. You won't hear audible voices. Some people will sometimes. It's amazing. But you'll hear things in your heart. You'll sense it. There'll be a peace that's around it. It'll drench exactly what you're seeing. So then So Jesse called the brothers and he made them pass before Samuel and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel and Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest and there he is keeping the sheep. So he didn't even get invited to this parade that they're showing off all this stuff. He wasn't even there. But then Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes, good looking. Oh yeah. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him for this is the one. And you know, there's an exclamation point. Like the Lord yelled this, that this is the one right here. The one that nobody thought. The one that not, and I want you to know the devil is trying to count you out. He doesn't think you're a threat. He thinks you're out in the field just doing little things. But little does he know God is about to line you up and say, this is my anointed one. And you are going to be used in such a way in this hour. I'm looking at David's and Davidettes all around this room tonight. And you are going to operate in the anointing. You are going to see the dead rays. You are going to see because that's the only way we are going to see another great awakening. That is the only way we are going to see revival happen on another level. We are not going to have it by just, oh, I felt goosebumps at church service. And I know, no, we need to start contending for signs, wonders, and miracles on the highest level. But we do that not by, we do it by being faithful that, that yes, Lord, we're going to do this tonight. Yes, Lord, we're going to talk about this tonight. Yes, Lord, we're going to go out outreach. Yes, Lord, we're going to do these groups. Yes, Lord, we're going to do this. We're going to go after this. We're going to sow here. We're going to sow there. And all of a sudden, boom, because you're just listening to his voice. You're not listening to what man said, what church planners say, what all these things are just, I just need to hear his voice. I cannot tell you how many nights that I've just gone before the Lord. And I'm just like, Lord, you feel pressure to do all these different things. Has anybody felt pressure financially before? You like, you want to do all these things, you hear all these things, and then I just say, Lord, the only thing I want more than anything is to hear your voice clearly. I don't need an answer to this right now. I need to just know I can hear from you. And if this is causing an infringement on me hearing you, Lord, I, I just need your voice because I know if I can just hear you and do what you say, the peace of God, the protection of God, the power of God will manifest in such glorious fashion. Amen. 
So he gets, he gets anointed as king. And then just go with me. I'm just going to breeze through 1 Samuel 17 because this is David and Goliath. So David gets anointed as a king, as a young boy, but then he doesn't even, op- he doesn't, he's, he's still just serving in, out in the field. Could you imagine getting a word from the Lord? Like you're called to do this. And then you just go back to doing what you always do, but you have this new understanding. But sometimes people hear a word from the Lord and they immediately jump and they start thinking that they're supposed to do all these things when really the Lord's just preparing your heart to see how you respond to that word. Do you stay faithful in what you're called to do? Or did that word of the Lord put you on a pedestal now? And now everybody's got to call you by a title the Lord gave you. You know what I'm talking about? This is real. This happens. David didn't start telling all of his brothers to call him a king. He didn't need anybody to. God already told him he was. If you need people to tell you who you are, then you don't know who you are. So. David's just out serving. He's just out doing these things. But here's the thing is once you become anointed, what's going to happen? When you become anointed of God, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. You have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden, the works of the enemy become very obvious to you. You need to hear that. You start seeing the enemy in such a way. People that when they would talk about, you know, you would hear, does anybody be around people that complain all the time? You know, before you might just, everybody should, everybody, go on Facebook. You you tell me none of your friends or family complain. Oh my gosh. So it's like people complain all the time, but before we're just like, oh, that's just so annoying. They complain all the time. Now you see it. It's a demonic attack on their life that causes them to constantly see all the horrible things all the time to magnify it. Because all complaining is, is faith in reverse. It's just, it's just proclaiming in reverse. It's just speaking death, but the Holy Spirit. So David's serving, and now the Philistines, if you go chapter 17, now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Soko, it belonged to Judah, and they encamped between Soka and Azekah and Ephesus and Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Allah and drew up in a battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and the valley between them. You know what I want you to know? What does the Bible say in 2 Corinthians? It says, take every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ and, or that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring it into obedience to Christ. Where was Goliath hanging out? He's hanging out on a mountain. The devil tries to get up on the mountains and he tries to intimidate and he tries to speak his, his agenda, his rhetoric, and it's all talk. Because when you read, it's so amazing when you see just how much of a wuss he really is. <laughs> you realize this, this pest that is causing all this stuff. I, I don't know about you, but when I realized, do you know how much when, when I found out who I was in Christ, I hate the devil. You, you need to understand, we need to hate the devil. I'm talking about this, and this is something we don't hear about enough, but you need to have a a righteous hatred for the devil, that you hate his agenda, you hate the things that he's doing, and the righteousness, the Holy Spirit puts this in you, that you don't tolerate it, that when you see your family members being plagued by the, the assignments of the enemy in darkness, it should do something to you. It should say, I refuse, and that you you proclaim and you stand and you hear from the Lord and you wait for Ramos to come forth. But we need to be in this, this time zone, understand that the anointing wants to break the yoke of what? Every bondage people are carrying. So when you see, and a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span, and he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had a bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to all the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And you, the servants of Saul, choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. So here's the thing about Goliath. He's got all this armor and spoiler alert, David defeats Goliath. But you hear how it talks about all this armor he has, talks about how big and bad he is. And then you know what he even does? He does this intimidation thing. He says, no, don't, we don't need to have this huge battle. 
We don't need it to be armies and armies. Just bring your best one out here and I'll take them. The enemy's negotiating, not realizing that his negotiation, somebody with the anointing is going to call him out on his negotiation. And it's going to be a little boy that has the anointing of God that says, yeah, you want to go one-on-one, bro? Well, I have the Lord of hosts behind me. You picked the wrong day to negotiate because the anointing of God is here. You see what I'm saying? The devil tries to think he's running the table. He tried right now. He thinks he's got America wrapped up. He thinks he's got, but I want you to know that there's churches that are rising up the body of Christ that says the devil, you want to negotiate? All right. This is what you want. Well, I'm telling you this. We know who he is. We have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us and we will not tolerate you to take our land. We will not tolerate you to close our churches. We will not tolerate. There's Sean King and his crap. People are talking about tearing down Jesus stuff what is this going on right now this is this is craziness the church needs to wake up it's not about building a little building it's not about it's about the church saying Goliath I want you you uncircumcised Philistine you, and you got a second we got to read this the anointing is oh, I, this is why this this story how do you just do this with kids without getting violent like how would be, I need to go back there and teach the kids the David and Goliath story you know it's like I want to get on manual get on my shoulders man and you will be Goliath and then uh, we'll put a costume on and then we'll get we'll get a uh, Gino to come throw a stone at us uh, <laughs> uh, but uh Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, why have you come out the lineup? We just read that. And then nine, if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. Okay. Okay. But here's the thing, enemy, is that if we win here, guess what? Did you know that the enemy, you can actually, his plans The Lord does this all the time. What the enemy uses for evil, you can take what the enemy's been doing against you and you can make it work for you because that's what the anointing does. Isn't that amazing? The enemy takes a punch and you're like, I'll take that, brother. You know what? You know, he tries to steal something. You know what? I'll take that back plus everything else that you've tried to steal from other generations and other things like that. And you call it forth. Recompense. God wants to see, God doesn't want to see his bride getting taken advantage of by this slime bucket. The enemy. We need, you know, you have authority. I need to say it again. Next time something's coming at you, the enemy's coming at you. You need to make sure you stand up and say that I'm anointed of God. This is the Holy Spirit dwells here and we will not tolerate this nonsense. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. So he says all this. Now, David was the son. I'm going down to 12. He was the son whose name was Jesse, who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years. In the days of Saul, the three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to battle. The names of the three sons, la, 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 verse 14. David was the youngest and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep. So what is he doing? He's still just being faithful, serving. And 16, so why this whole thing is going on, this is why I want you to know right now, this is why this is such a word, why the world is in chaos right now, what is David doing? I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice, hey, sheep, you know, just loving, just love, and he's he's completely ignorant in a good way to all the things that the devil, and he just shows up on the scene, (laughs) Uh, he, and this is what happens. You'll just leave a moment of being in the presence of God. And then, did you hear what's on the news? Oh, is that what we need to come against today? Is that what the devil is doing today? Is that what the church needs to come against today? It's not like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that either. No, we got this. We're anointed. <laughs> we got this. Amen. We know who our dad is. We don't need to fl- freak out. And then it says, and the Philistines drew near and presented him For 40 days, 40 days of this nonsense. This is the devil. He's so, it's the same thing every day. La, 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 you know, know, and he goes through the same thing every day. Send your best out. Come serve. It's the same thing over and over again. And he's going for it. And 17, then Jesse said to his son, take now for your brothers an ephod of his dry grain and these 10 loaves and run to your brothers at the camp. Carry these 10 cheeses. He's just carrying grilled cheeses out to his brothers of their thousand and see how your brothers fare and bring back news of them. 
So David's just going to deliver food. It's Joe, it's Jonah. He's like, he's like, he's delivering, he's delivering food right now, being faithful, but he's about to go to another level, man. Speaking this over Joe right now. This is a word. And then run your brothers and carry these. And then now Saul and they are all the men of Israel were in the valley of Eli fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning. So he, he gets told to do something. He gets told to deliver sandwiches. And you know what he does? He doesn't wait till he's like, it's not a big deal. You know, I'll wait till later. He rises early in the morning to do this, this task. He left with the sheep and he's leaving ready to deliver sandwiches. But the Lord is saying, this boy is about to take out a giant today. And God's smiling because David doesn't even know yet. David's just delivering grilled cheeses, being faithful. And this is what you all need to understand is that what's about to happen is you're going to be faithful with God has said, and all of a sudden a Goliath is going to come. And you have to know that. And what does David do when all this happens? He's going, and then he rose early, left with the sheep, the keeper, and took the things, went to Jesse, commanded him, and then the camp, the army was going about for Israel, and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array against the army. David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was a champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. David heard them. Everybody say, David heard them. So here's the thing is all the, all the believers, all the Israel, they've been hearing this for 40 days. David only had to hear the devil speak one time to know that I'm not tolerating this crap. Do you see what I'm saying? It takes somebody with the anointing that everybody's like, you know, we're all getting sick right now. It's flu season. You know, we're all, it's all, it takes somebody that's like, no, 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 sorry. That's not how we operate, right? No, it's like, but we hear these things and we all adapt to what we've been hearing. But somebody with the anointing hears the devil speak one time and he's just, no, that's not happening here. Because the devil just wants a foothold. Just, just wants a little bit. <laughs> and then, so, and then he talked with them and there was, and then 24, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him because they were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that that man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man? So this is the thing is that they all heard the threat of the enemy and saw him running and they all go running. David hears what the reward is. He doesn't care what the enemy says. He says, can somebody tell me what the reward is again? Why would he do that? Because that's what a child of God does. A child of God is like, the, we don't want to hear what the enemy has to say again. Somebody tell me what the promises of God are again. Somebody remind me, somebody remind me that, that you're telling me that if I take this joker out, that I don't have to pay taxes anymore, that I get a bride, that I get all these things. All I have to do is take out that joker. Amen. Tell me the reward again. Yes. Tell me it again. That's why we're here tonight. I'm preaching it to you again because God's about to do it again, again, and again because he's faithful. He's faithful. And then I will give, and then David spoke to, he said, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That's somebody that doesn't have covenant with God. Somebody that is not in relationship with God. How can he defy the armies of the living God? David doesn't even care what all is going on. He's just like, how dare, how dare they mock God? How dare like it bothered him so much. And the people answered him in this manner saying, so shall it be done for the man who kills him. What? Now Elab, the oldest brother heard when he spoke to the men, Elab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? You see his family's coming against him because now David's speaking a different way because the anointing has done something in his life that I know we grew up this way, but God did something in my life and I don't talk that way anymore. I don't think that way anymore. And that when a situation arises, you may judge me thinking that I'm, I'm, I'm raising these standards, but all I'm doing is I'm doing this because I love you so much. And if you see the glory of God in me, then maybe you'll surrender your life to him. So David keeps going even with the persecution. It'll come from your family. It'll come from your close friends because if the devil can't get you to bow, he'll try to get somebody close to you to make you. And you need to be alert for that. Who with whom have you 
left those few sheep. So they're trying to say, you're, you know, you should be doing the sheep. I know your pride in the inside. You see, the devil is trying to talk David out because I think the reason why the devil is using the brothers to talk David, because even the devil knows Goliath's in trouble because this boy knows something. Because the, the, the devil has been tormenting Israel for 40 days, but this is the first time somebody has spoken up and the devil took notice. And he's like, we got to try to shut him up. So let's get his family members against him. Let's get him to shut up. Let's get him to back down from the call. But the thing is, is that David has been convinced. So he keeps going. And then it says in 29, David says, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from them and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. So what did he do? He asked for the reward again. He wanted to hear it again. Now, when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul and they sent for him. Did you notice that the message that God gave him put him before the king? And what was his message? His message was to come against the darkness that was going, that what God has put in you is going to put you before people with with major influence. But here's the thing is those people with major influence, they're going to end up serving the vision God's given you. You're not going to serve them because Saul ended up, you know, the... Saul ended up in a bad place, but God put David before him to supersede him in that. Now, David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. So Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to go with him for you are a youth and a man of war from his, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said, you see this intimidation factor. Did you know the devil has been around a lot longer than you have? He, he's seen a lot. He's, but he, that's exactly right. He's lost over and over. He's the biggest loser ever. That's his track record. Can you imagine? Do you know what it's like to lose every day? Like, <laughs> like eternal loser. Like, he's Lucifer. <laughs> eternal loser. Like, just, and that, but the thing is, is he tries to intimidate and get you, because if he doesn't, if he can get you to just not step out, then he wins by default. Then David said to Saul, let, and then in, and it says, Saul said to David, okay, 34, David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after and struck it. So you see what David does now is all that time he was with the sheep, his testimony was growing and growing and growing. And it seemed like a man that wasn't prepared. But in fact, while he was tending those sheep, he was taking out bears and lions. He wasn't no little boy out there. He was becoming a warrior, but he was getting trained God's way, not man's way. And God wants to train you up in the secret place. He wants to train you up in your workplace to see things in a certain way. And you're about to get elevated and promoted to such a way. Keep your heart right. Keep your heart humble. Look at David as an example. Because Jesus became the son of David and followed the same line as Jesus was the most humblest man. He wasn't trying to be seen. In fact, he would tell people, don't tell people about me. Because he was trying to wait for it. It, It was never about... The, the man, Jesus, it was about his father's business and then him being glorified by his father, not him self-glorifying himself. That's Satan-like. So he tells his testimony. But here's the thing about what do we know that there's, and I'm, I'm wrapping up. I know we're going. I just sense that this is, there's power in what? Our testimony. So when David shares this testimony, it says, moreover, David said in verse 37, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, go and let the Lord be with you. When David shared his testimony, the anointing was on it. The, the, the king didn't want him to go, but as soon as David shared it, he's like, wow, just by his testimony. Did you know your testimony is powerful? What God has done for you, it'll do something. It'll break down walls in people's lives that when you're, you, you got to get this, that your story with him is so powerful. So Saul clothed David with his armor and he put the bronze helmet on his head. He clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened the sword in his armor and tried to walk, but he couldn't get it on. So then, then he, he couldn't go to battle with something that didn't get him there. And that's the thing is that you see how the devil is trying to get him to compromise all the way up to the battle. That he's, even when he gets there, it's like, David, use wisdom, brother. Use my, use my stuff. But Dave, that's not how David got to that moment, was through man's help. It was through him being submissive to the principles of God and his relationship with the Father got him there. 
And he was convinced of that. So it said David took them off because he had not tested them. In verse 40, he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. I heard that Goliath had four brothers. So that's why he picked up five stones because he wanted to make sure you get them all. He's going to be a one-eyed sniper. He's going to get each one with one hit. You know, I've heard some people say five's the number of grace, but I like to think that it was five, five giants David was about to take out. He's just ready to go to war. This little boy, nobody's got his back. This is the church right now. The devil looks like Goliath right now to the church. Let's just be real. It doesn't look like the church. It looks like any time the church even speaks up, the radical believers, when they speak up, it's like they're hate. It's hate message. Something's, gonna, something's gotta break. It's gotta happen. And it's going to. Say amen to that. So he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five stones from the brook and he put them in the shepherd's bag in the pouch which he laid, the sling in which his hand he drew near the Philistine. So the Philistine came, began drawing near to David and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when Philistine, when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beast of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And we talked about this last name, uh, last week, that the God of armies of Israel, that the Lord of hosts is the, the God of angel armies whom you have defied this day. Everybody say this day, yes. not tomorrow, not later. Right now, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. Do you know how big God was smiling? Finally, finally, somebody stood up to the plate having the anointing of God and said, today, the Lord, he doesn't say, I, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. You know, we hear so many times that the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's, but he needs somebody on the battleground. He needs somebody to step up and let him use them. So it says, then, I love this part, and this is where we're in. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth. Then all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. So how are people going to know there's a God when the enemy is getting his face rubbed in his own feces? That's why we have to understand the Bible says that you are more than conquerors through Christ who loves you. What does it mean to be more than a conqueror? What does that mean? It means that you have won in such a way that you humiliate. Make a mockery of the enemy and what he's done in your past and in life. So, so it was when the Philistine arose and came near and drew to meet David that David hurt. So, this is my favorite part. Like I said, we're, we're ending here. We're landing. This is good. Is this helping anybody? I'm just making sure. Hey, if you're bored, just leave. I'm just saying. I'm having a good time right now. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew to meet David. So the Philistine, what is the enemy doing? He's intimidating again. He's like, I'm going to start walking. Soon as the enemy moves, it said that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Soon as the, soon as Goliath started walking, it was like cue that when the enemy starts creeping into your life, creeping into your family, creeping into things, you run at him. You run at him and you stand your ground and you say, not in my house, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You start pre preaching. And letting the enemy know who you are, where you're at. Amen. So he ran and, he, and then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone. He wasn't, he didn't even have the stone in his hand yet. He's running and he's pulling things out while he's running. He's not even, he doesn't know what he's doing. He just knows that that Goliath is going down today. We're not all going to have perfect plans, what God's telling us to do. But do it faithfully and do it in the name of the Lord and go after it doesn't have to be perfect because a stone can't take out a giant right and that's not how you take out a giant but that's all David had and that's all David knew and the Lord honored it because he honored the heart that wanted to defeat the enemy any heart that wants to defeat the enemy in the name of the Lord any weapon will do <laughs> any resource will do so that now David put it in his hand, took out the stone, struck the Philistine in the forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead. How many people can't wait to watch this in heaven? See, here's the thing. He fell on his face to the earth. Now, if you got hit in the head, you would fall backwards. 
but it's so significant and made them fall forward because you're going to bow. You're going to bow in defeat. You're going to pay homage to the Lord. Bow. And then you know what David did? Just he didn't cut off his head with a sword he had because what did, the, what did, what did Jesus do? He stole back the keys. He got the keys back. He didn't steal them. He took them back. And what the devil was trying to condemn the body with, with the word of God, with the law, that David took the sword from the enemy and cut the enemy's head off. And it's the same thing. We have to understand that in this hour, I know we went a little longer tonight, but this was so important, so important. So I just want to pray over everybody right now. If you just lift your hands. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for these people, Lord. Father, I thank you for the anointing right now. Begin to speak to the things that they need to be faithful in, the things that you've called them to do, the things that they need to stand in right now, Lord. I thank you that you would reveal those steps that need to be taken. It says in, in the Bible, we didn't get to it tonight, but it says in Hebrews 1.9, it actually says it in Psalms as well, but it says that Jesus was anointed with the oil of gladness. <laughs> And I'm telling you, you're going to need a lot of joy for the things that the enemy is going to try to challenge you with. But I'm here to tell you, you already have the victory because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That so many people will try to tell you the devil is going to come at this way, come at this way, come at this way. Don't be intimidated by him. He is defeated. But don't think he's not going to try to challenge you. Don't think it's going to just be butterflies and rainbows and gumdrops. The devil knows you're anointed and he wants to do anything he can to keep you back. But I sense that there's just the Lord wants to anoint his people with gladness tonight. One of my, the verses that's been on my heart so much lately, Acts 20, 24, but none of these things move me. None of these things move me so that I may finish my race with joy and my ministry that the Lord has given me to testify of the gospel, of the grace of God. None of these things move me, that I may finish my race with what? Joy. What, what, how did Jesus finish his race? The joy set before him. Maybe it's time you start laughing a little bit more. Maybe it's time you allow the joy of the Lord to really get you to a place. I really believe that maybe when David cut Goliath's head off, he was just laughing. <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe you got to just think about this, like, come on, you guys were intimidated by this, by this. He looked big and bad, but no, it doesn't matter how big and bad it looks. The Lord is greater. The Lord is bigger than any situation you're facing. Well, we love you all. God bless. We'll see you guys next week.